and I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our speaker today, uh, Berta Puj, who is uh, coming to us from Hamburg, uh, Eppendorf. Uh, and she's going to uh, to tell us about a, a, a paper. So this was a preprint that was um, that was that was first put out some months ago, um, and now I understand it has been accepted um, in Journal of Extracellular Vesicles with some with some changes. Um, so congratulations to you and your co-authors on that. And we're uh, we're looking forward to reading it, but uh, but of course hearing about it today um, in your presentation. So thanks again, um, and I'll hand the screen sharing over to you. So thank you very much, Ken. Um, for this uh, introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to the, uh, participate into the journal club because I think it's a it's a great opportunity to present our work and um, and yes to get some input and to get some uh, some suggestions and because you know this is not a um, finished work so um, so we will keep working on that so we are open to any uh, comments and suggestions and I'm here with Hermann Altmeppen and Sandra Brenner, which are also um, the two of the, um, so Sandra is the first author of the paper, is a PhD student, and um, Hermann Altmeppen is one of the main collaborators in this study. So this is a, it's a very long uh, title in this, I'm very happy to share it. This is how it will look more or less uh, when once it's uh, published in Journal of Extracellular Vesicles. And uh, what I will talk today has exactly two parts. No? First of all, I will talk about the characterization of brain-derived extracellular vesicles, reveals changes in the ce cellular origin after stroke. And then in the second part, I will talk about enrichment of the prion protein with a potential role in cellular uptake. So I will not make any introduction about extracellular vesicles, but I will talk a little bit first about stroke. So um, a stroke is the second, um, one moment, is the second most common cause of death and main cause of disability worldwide. It's caused, um, so the, the most frequent one is uh, ischemic stroke. And in the ischemic stroke, what we find is that a main artery, or so an artery of the brain, it's blocked. And that leads to a uh, lack of glucose and um, a lack of oxygen in the tissue that is irrigated from this artery. That means that um, the tissue there will die very early from uh, necrosis. But surrounding this tissue is what we call the penumbra, where um, cells, um, here it's a, a picture about what happens in the penumbra. Cells are uh, electrically silent, so uh, but metabolically active. That means that what happens in the next hours here in the penumbra, um, it's very important because cells can be, neurons could be rescued, and um, uh, the stroke can and the clinical outcome will be better. So what happens in this penumbra? So we have um, glutamate that it's coming from the neurons that die here. We have waves of calcium and spreading depolarizations. And then the neurons will go into a commitment point where they will die or not. Also, even if they die by apoptosis, the release of probably maybe uh, extracellular vesicles, ApoEVs, will cause a secondary necrosis if they are not taken up early enough, and this will cause inflammation. That means that the pathophysiology of a stroke is quite a bit complicated because on top of the cells that we have in the brain, we also have um, some, um, some infiltrating cells uh, due to the inflammation and the uh, break of the blood-brain barrier. So there are some studies done in uh, EVs in stroke. Everything is done in vitro. And for example, is it, uh, is it shown that um, oligodendrocytes can release some extracellular vesicles, that they can help neurons that are undergoing ischemic uh, damage to help them uh, survive? But on the other hand, for example, microglia or inflammatory microglia, microglia can also release some extracellular vesicles that they are detrimental to the synapses. So we see that exosomes in the, in the, in the brain, uh, they can have, under these pathological conditions, they can have positive effects and negative effects. 
And what is more studied in stroke is um, the role of the mesenchymal uh, stem cells because it has been shown that um, extracellular vesicles released by these mesenchymal, mesenchymal stem cells can have uh, regenerative effects, angiogenesis, synaptogenesis, neurogenesis. But not that much is known about um, extracellular vesicles. What are the extracellular vesicles in stroke doing? So this, when we start, uh, started this study three years ago, more or less, these were our main aims. First of all, and it's maybe not that, um, that easy, uh, so uh, can we isolate extracellular um, uh, vesicles from brain? If so, if we can get it, how do different brain cell populations contribute to the total pool of um, extracellular vesicles in steady state conditions and what happens after experimental stroke? Also, because um, so previously I'm coming from the prion field and we know that uh, the prion protein is also in extracellular vesicles. So we wanted to also check um, how does the prion protein look like in uh, brain EVs and after stroke. But this about the prion protein is something that I will talk in the second part of the talk. So now we focus in the extracellular vesicles from brain. So I will explain a little bit about the model that we use. The model that we use is the transient middle cerebral artery occlusion. Um, so this is our mouse model. This make a kind of a stroke, a transient stroke. And uh, what we do is just that in order to uh, isolate the EVs, we take half of the hemisphere, the affected hemisphere, or in the case of SHAMS, which uh, they are mice that undergo more or less the same procedure, but not the occlusion that we do in the arteries. So we take the half of the brain and then we use a protocol that was published by um, Bella et al. in 2017. So we do a collagenase, collagenase digestion. So then we follow several centrifugation steps, 300 Gs, 10,000 Gs, and then we do a sucrose gradient. From the sucrose gradient, we centrifugate uh, three hours, uh, 180,000 Gs, I think. And then from this, we take the six, six different gradients. Differently from uh, the protocol of Bella is that here we introduce a filtration step. It's because, I mean, several protocols that were published also um, before and that uh, they also isolate EVs from brain, they were using this filtration method. And in fact, what we wanted is to have small EVs. So we decided to uh, put this filtration step here. So because we put this filtration step, we introduced this filtration step. First of all, we wanted to characterize these uh, brain-derived EVs, filter versus non-filter. So we always use the total staining to refer, um, to refer um, for the quantifications and so, because I mean, there is not um, a marker that maybe it's not changing um, uh, in, the, in the stroke. So we always use this total staining. And as you see here, it's already in the filter. We lose a lot of protein. But in fact, I mean, um, as you can see here and here, in the non-filter, but also in the filter, in the fractions three and four, we recover markers of extracellular vesicles, Alex Plotilin CD81, and we don't have um, contamination. And these two fractions correspond exactly in the two fractions that more or less it's, um, it's described for the exosomes. So then, of course, we do uh, electron microscopy. And um, well, I was a bit surprised. I thought that maybe in the non-filter we will find more, uh, more stuff. But what we find is vesicles, more or less, that are a little bit bigger. And when we filter, we uh, have a more clear population. So a smaller vesicles. This is um, 200 nanometers. When we do uh, NTA analysis, we see that, of course, the concentration of the particles decrease with the filter. We get, um, uh, and we get by the size, uh, a smaller vesicle. So we are here about the mean size of 188 uh, nanometers. So this is what we, um, because without filtering, they are a little bit um, so bigger than 200 nanometers. So we are uh, exactly talking about a small extracellular vesicles. 
as a proof of principle, because we wanted to also do some imaging, so we uh, check how the confocal microscopy look like. So we label the extracellular vesicles with M-clink. And then when we do a step microscopy, in fact, we see that this blurry thing, I don't know if you see it very well, but if you see this blurry stuff, it's in fact accumulations of um, some extracellular vesicles. So that they are there here, for example. So then we did mass spectrometry also of the filtered versus non-filtered. And in fact, uh, from the heat map and also from this volcano plot and also for the principal component analysis, one can see that in fact we have two differentiated populations as the composition of the protein. When we check this with Fundrich, and uh, we check for uh, molecular, uh, molecular function of the, of the proteins that are enriched, what we see is that in filters, uh, small EVs, uh, we, find, we find that they are very much enriched in everything that is related, by, um, related to ribosomal proteins or RNA binding. When we do string analysis, we also see the same here. I mean, you, of course, you cannot read anything, but here it, you see a cluster that is um, related to ribosomal proteins. And when you uh, check the KEEG pathways, you see that when you don't do this filtered, um, this filtered, um, um, this filtration, um, what you see, and here I have it as a, as a high, um, headline. So you see that um, in non-filtered EVs, you have plenty of proteins that are more associated to the metabolic pathways. And in the filter, something that is more related to the ribosomes. Okay, so now we have these two different populations and from now onwards, we only work with the two fractions, the third and the fourth fraction pooled and only with small EVs. So in order to check the relative contribution of major brain cell types to the um, SEV pool, we made a very straightforward analysis. So we thought, okay, so if we check some markers of the brain cells and we compare enrichment in the extracellular vesicles compared to the total homogenate, so maybe we can have an idea of what is the participation of these uh, extracellular vesicles from the cell population. So because one extracellular, so the extracellular vesicle can pack, um, pack more one marker than another one, that's why we use two markers. So for example, for, uh, for microglia, we use uh, P2I12 and TMM119. For, uh, as a marker of oligodendrocytes, oh, sorry, this. Uh, we have uh, PLP and CNP1 as a marker of neurons, synaps synapsin 1 and SNAP25, and the two ART1 and 2 for as a marker of astrocytes. So we, when we quantify this, we see that in fact, uh, P2I12 in TMM, they follow the same pattern, so they are increased in EVs when you relate it uh, to the total homogenate and not the other ones. Well, in fact, neuronal uh, markers are decreased. So what we think is that microglia are the dominant source of brain EVs, small EVs under physiological conditions. So here I just want to, to, to make you aware that in the TMM 119, which is um, very, so there's not that many papers about TMM 119, but it's a marker of microglia. We see that in the uh, small EVs, maybe, uh, um, a fragment or a splice version is there. Okay, so the question is, okay, what happens in stroke? So we do it the same, but in this case, you only see the um, small EVs from SHEM and uh, after um, experimental stroke, and we do a quantification, always refer it to the total staining. And so what we see here is now the population changes. So now it looks like in the TMCAO, we have a higher population uh, belonging more to the astrocytes. And this is 24 hours after the TMCAO. So for the first part of this talk, what we could assess is that we have um, um, an SEV pool, small uh, extracellular vesicles, which is um, uh, in steady state conditions, 
microglia is um, as uh, um, micro uh, so uh, as if it's from microglia are enriched in this pool, but after a stroke, what we see is that um, the pool the enrichment change and go more into the astrocytes. But because I'm also coming from the prion field. Uh, and we know that the prion is in extracellular vesicles, we also check what happens uh, 24 hours after stroke with prion protein. What we see here is that the prion protein is also increased after uh, TMCAO. So um, let me introduce a little bit about the cellular prion protein. So the prion protein is a GPI anchor protein with two N-glycans. And um, it's more, um, it's at the plasma membrane in lipid drafts and is more known because um, the prion protein, when misfolds, is the causative agent of the prion diseases. And as a prion diseases, you know, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, mad cow disease, BSE, uh, etc. So, although it's, so it's highly expressed in neurons, it's uh, evolutionary conserved but because the knockout mice they don't show a major uh, a major deficit so we don't really still we don't really know the physiological function of the prion protein so it has been shown that uh, it can participate in neurot neurite outgrowth in neuroprotection in synapse, synapse function signaling or for example very important cell adhesion also it's a known resident of the EVs. So all these functions probably are coming because physiologically the prion protein um, uh, can have uh, several cleavages. Here there's the alpha cleavage and the shedding, but what is more important for the, the talk now, I will not enter into the functions of the, all these um, uh, proteolytic fragments, but what is more important for this talk is this C1 fragment. So, also, the prion protein, um, uh, it's important in stroke because it has been seen that has beneficial effects. And here, because of the prion protein, it has been also involved with many partners. So this is a bit complicated uh, slide, so I will not go through it. But for example, this is very important. In mice, that they don't have the prion protein and that they, um, and that they, that they, uh, they suffer from a TNCAO, so um, the outcome is much worse, clinically is much worse, and the size of a stroke is bigger. So in fact, um, the prion protein is neuroprotective, uh, front is uh, hypo uh, hypoxic damage, and also correlates with the infarct, infarct size. So when prion inversely correlates with the infarct size. So when mice overexpress the prion protein, they have smaller infarct sizes. So this, that's why it's very attractive also for, um, for a stroke. And then, of course, we check what happens with prion protein in extracellular vesicles. And so we check also what, um, what is the pattern when it's not filtered and when it's filtered. And something that it directly pop up in our, in our eyes is just that in the total homogenate uh, of the brain, you see that there's a main deglycosylated um, de band of the full length PRP. But if you see the pattern of the, um, of the EBs, the pattern is very changed in both, in both uh, instances. And it seems that here, there's a more prominent band than here that could potentially be, um, be um, either diglycosylated C1 fragment or the unglycosylated full length PRP. So that's why then we went and we did PNGAs. With the PNGAs, what we, take, we, what we do is that we take out the glycans. And what we could assess is that in fact, as you can see here, so it's uh, when uh, deglycosylated, it corresponds to the unglycosylated uh, band of the C1. So it's really enriched in C1. When we do a quantification of the, um, the amount of prion protein in extracellular vesicles in the small EVs compared to the total homogenate, the same thing that we have done before, we see that it's really enriched. It's, uh, it's a, a double enrichment in uh, small extracellular vesicles. But we don't do, so PRP and the C1 proteolytic fragment is enriched in, this, uh, in the small EVs, but now, what we don't do is just that we don't quantify this, um, this C1. 
why we don't quantify this C1? Well, so um, the paper went to several revisions and um, one, uh, one of the, the revisions that uh, was asked if the collagenase could do some effect into, um, uh, into the prion protein. And this is also very important to, to have it in mind when we are using uh, membrane proteins. So what we did then is just we checked the 300 G pellets. Till now, we only were using total homogenate. So we took a, a part of the brain, a cortex part of the brain, and that we were using it as a comparison to see the markers. But as uh, in the protocol of Bella, it's described that the 300 G pellet is used as also a total homogenate. Then we check this pellet, and in fact, what we saw is that yes, partially, not always, sometimes we have a C1 fragment that is appearing already in the pellets. This is something that doesn't happen for all the proteins. For example, as you remember before, I, I, I showed you that in extracellular vesicles, this TNM119 was, uh, was a little bit, uh, so very much um, um, down, so around 19 kilodaltons or something like this. And here you see that in this 300 G pellets is not like this. So we have a partial effect of the collagenase. So yeah, so we were a little bit shocked about it. So we didn't uh, think that this uh, could be an effect. So uh, what we decided then is that, okay, then we check a cell culture. How does it look in, in, in cell lines? Because these, of course, they don't go through the collagenase uh, procedure. So um, we took n 2 cells. And what we saw is that, uh, in fact, in n 2 cells, when this is the LIZE, and when you do this PNGase uh, treatment, we also see that, in fact, in the EVs uh, coming from n 2 cells, we also see um, that there's um, C1, that it's enriching C1, and this is the quantification. And another cell line, an EPO, we also see the same when you relate one to the other. So there's an enrichment of the C1. So, in fact, in these two cell lines, PRPC1 is indeed enriched in EVs. Um, so although we cannot quantify what happens in the brain, we see we, we are very positive that uh, there's um, an increase of C1 also, but we cannot quantify. Okay. So, and this, because C1, um, so now I will talk about the, the C1 and this, that it's enriched in EVs made us uh, remember about what happens with um, some viral surface proteins. Because the C1, when it has the alpha cleavage, then it gets exposed here in a hydrophobic domain. If you check what happens also in uh, the fusion proteins of some virus, for example, the Nipah virus, um, also it gets cleaved and this uh, hydrophobic domain get, um, get exposed. So after this, we thought, okay, so due to these similarities, it could potentially be that somehow the prion protein, the C1 of the C1 protein tethers, um, so the EVs to the, um, to, the, to the recipient cell, or even is helping some, somehow in the fusion. So then we went to cell culture, and so we took here um, uh, EVs, wild type EVs, and also we uh, isolate um, EVs coming from knockout mice, a PRP knockout mice. So what we see is that after one hour incubation, this we, we label with m clean, and this we see in white. And after one hour incubation, we see that the, for the wild type, there's a very, very diffuse staining here. Whereas for um, the knockout PRP, we already see that there's plenty in the membrane and there's uh, some dotty stuff. Also, when we uh, check what happens with the lysosomes, we see that it's, uh, some of the extracellular vesicles, they already made it to enter inside the cell, inside the cell. And it's not something that we see with uh, wild type EVs. When we um, quantify this, we see that in the knockout, uh, we see, although we put exactly all the time the same amount of EVs, we see that there's more EVs that are uh, already bound or inside, um, the, uh, inside the, the recipient cells. 
because this, um, this cell culture was um, normal cell culture, so um, of uh, primary neurons. Um, we saw that we had it a little bit of contamination with microglia cells. And when we check these microglia cells, we see that uh, when it's a knockout, uh, the knockout PRP, it's really, really taken up. We use another type of culture where we culture uh, the neurons with, uh, with a layer of astrocytes and therefore they are not that much uh, contaminated with microglia because they can, they can survive better. Um, and, uh, but we see exactly the same. I don't, I don't show the pictures here, but after quantification, we see that in this um, low density um, cultures, we also see that there's an increase of the EVs that are either in the surroundings or already inside the cells uh, when there's um, PRP knockouts. Okay, so because we saw this microglia, we also check what happens with glial cells, in this case microglia and astrocytes, when they are incubated with uh, these EVs. As you can see here in the confocal microscopy, very few staining is uh, seen with wild type, but uh, when you use the knockout, you see an increase of a staining, as we saw before. Then we did mixed cultures of microglia and astrocytes. We isolate this, um, this microglia and astrocytes, and then we also incubate them with, um, with, um, with EVs, uh, small EVs, and we see that in both instances, we see that either microglia and astrocytes, both of them, they take much avidly um, the um, small EVs. Okay. After three hours of incubation, what we see is that here there's a still a very, very much diffuse staining and some of the extracellular vesicles are starting to enter. Some of them, they are still on the membrane and some of them, um, they are entering and somehow colocalizing with the lysosomes, whereas in the knockout, most of them, uh, as, a, as a big dots, they are uh, inside. And I repeat, I mean, we are always putting the same amount of um, extracellular uh, vesicles. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and here, most of them, they already very readily uh, colocalize with the lysosomes. Okay, and this uh, gets me to the uh, take home message that, uh, that we give with this work is that the PRP and its C1 fragment is probably influencing the EVs uptake. So um, we propose that when there is a full length PRP or PRP C1, the um, extracellular vesicle has more probability to fuse. And that's why we see this diffuse staining in the confocal microscopy, whereas somehow, uh, when PRP is not there and also not the C1, um, it enters uh, probably uh, so fast by endocytosis. So we think that this, um, the modulation of the prion protein could have consequences in the fusion. And so when, uh, when the EVs, uh, so the loading of the prion protein in EVs maybe have cons functional consequences and, um, and makes that these EVs, they have more tendency to fusion. Okay. But of course, I mean, we still have many things that are left as open questions. So for example, and here I mentioned some, so is the increase of the, pre the prion protein after stroke is related to a particular brain cell population? For example, we see that astrocytes are increased and PRP is increased, but we cannot make the direct uh, relation um, PRP on astrocytes is increased. So for this, we will need some other experiments. Uh, also, our astrocytes, what we see, you know, that this increase in astrocytes EVs are detrimental or beneficial uh, 24 hours after stroke, which is the cargo that they, they have. Also, and this is a big question that needs uh, plenty of experiments probably, is how is PRP or PRP-C1 mediating or helping to the, to the fusion of EVs with recipient cells? And uh, well, I think we um, also, as I, sh I showed you that some membrane proteins are, um, are cut uh, probably with this collagen as a treatment. So we are also trying to improve the isolation protocol. 
And with this, I would like to thank you all of you and uh, well, to thank my group and thank all the collaborators and of course, all of you for your attention. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to receive any questions. Thank you very much. Well, thanks so much, Berta, for uh, sharing this very nice work with us. Um, we do have, um, I think some questions are coming in right now and I've received some personally. Uh, but I, I guess I just wanna start out with, um, you know, asking you about where you feel we are. You mentioned uh, maybe a need to improve our separation protocols. Where do you think we are right now with, uh, with brain EV separation and, um, and I guess some of the factors like how much material can we start with? I mean, that's one that we always struggle with. Um, what, um, what, if, what steps in the protocol do we need to, um, to explore um, for, for optimization? Because I have to be honest with you, my group has really struggled with the, with the, the purity of our mouse brain uh, separations, um, whereas we can get, I, I think, very good results with human brain. When we go to other, um, other animals, um, mm -hmm. it seems to be a little bit more challenging. It looks like you have great, um, great results there. I'm wondering, you know, how can we how can we all work together as a field to to make sure that we have the the best protocols? Yes, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think that we should agree in the, in some protocol. I mean, we should do more, much more um, analysis on everything, and then agree in in some protocol. No, um, I mean, what you say that uh, that with uh, human. Uh, you get very good results, and with mouse not. I mean, this is uh, super interesting. I mean, um, I don't, I don't really know where this lays uh, on. I think, I really think that um, my opinion is that uh, by introducing this filtration step, I mean, it's true that we lose uh, larger vesicles, but we are probably also cleaning a little bit about. I mean for sure we are kind of cutting uh, when we are uh, using the, the collagenase or when we are cutting the brain. I mean, for sure we uh, do some debris that we, don't, but that we don't want. And so I think that by using this, um, this filtration step, um, it's a way of improving uh, the protocol. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that I also think that it's very, um, also probably improves the protocol and it's something that we are also going through to it. It's just maybe the use of OptiPrep, so the Yodixanol gradient, and maybe to put it on the bottom of the Yodixanol gradient that, that also then for flotation, uh, not that many things float where um, the exosomes or the extracellular vesicles in fact uh, should be. So I think that um, maybe um, this is a good direction to go. I mean, now there's plenty of these protocols with uh, Yodixanol that it looks um, quite good. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I'm wondering, have you, uh, we have a question here from uh, Lucia Languina who asks about the concentration of collagenase that you're using. And have you, have you tried enzymes other than collagenase? Yes, um, I, we tried papain. And uh, our feeling, maybe also Santra can um, reply for this. Uh, our feeling is that uh, papain is a little bit, even a bit harsher than mm -hmm. the collagenase. And then we try also collagenase 4. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it's a mixture of enzymes. So uh, probably we also have to play a little bit with the time because we use 20 minutes as uh, was described in the protocol. Uh, and uh, maybe with a little bit less of uh, time, uh, we could potentially have also good results. Um, and I don't want to hog all the time here, but I, I also want to ask if you've tried just uh, simply incubating tissue um, in some media to see what uh, see what kind of gets released without without even digesting. Uh, yes, I think Santra maybe um, Santra can um, reply to that because I uh, think we tried. Yeah, sorry. I think um, I need to allow participants to unmute. Okay, so Santra, if you'd like to. Jump in there. You can unmute yourself. So, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so, to um, I saw that someone was asking uh, for the concentration of the collagenase, and we used exactly the same of uh, the Vella protocol. So, this uh, 70, uh, 75 units per ml, uh, so per, uh, per uh, media ml, and. Uh, um, what uh, better would you try? You try also the incubation without uh, without any collagenase, nothing, no? 
Yes, but uh, it was um, so we were was the time when we were uh, testing this uh, uh, pellet, so the three hundred G's pellet, mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, yeah, almost we get nothing, but nothing. Yes, no? uh, yeah, that's the thing that uh, you don't get nothing. But uh, yeah, so we were not. Uh, so the protocol was not really, so now we are trying to think uh, something better, a way to do it and retrieve at the same time uh, without, so retrieving EVs without damaging the um, membrane proteins. Because yeah. the integrins, like as you mentioned, you know, surface proteins are the first to go when we treat with enzymes. So we had to play quite a bit with collagenase concentration to yes. reduce cleavage of uh, the surface receptors. But I think you are already doing this. Yeah, we are thinking about it also, as Beata mentioned, uh, the timing. So uh, I think the Bella protocol is 20 minutes of incubation. Most probably this is uh, quite aggressive. So aggressive, uh, it's um, too long maybe. And uh, we also tried with papain, which uh, is, uh, um, I would say, an aggressive enzyme. And uh, the inhibition uh, requires some specific, um, uh, so it has to be more specific. So uh, Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Great. Okay. So um, um, I'm going to, I think, go to the questions, uh, some other questions now, but we have some, uh, some questions from Yvonne. So Yvonne works on stroke. And so she says she has some, uh, some good questions here for you. Um, and so she first asks, um, what about endothelium derived EVs? Have you looked for those considering that the blood brain barrier is so affected, uh, you know, in, in, in stroke? Uh, yeah, this is a very good question, uh, and in fact, uh, yes, we didn't in this in this uh, first shot of uh, we didn't uh, consider the extracellular either endothelial cells, but uh, but yes, it's uh, they are very important, and uh, and probably we also would like to check endothelial cells uh, because they also release a lot of EBs. Mm -hmm. mm. um, and then she also asks about the time post stroke. So after you um, after you induce your model. Um, what are what are the time points that you uh, prefer to look at? So we induce uh, the stroke forty five minutes. Uh, forty minutes, and 40 then minutes so the uh, artery is occluded for 30, uh, forty minutes, and then uh, the uh, after the reperfusion, uh, the animal is sacrificed. In this case, twenty four hours. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, in our lab, we also now are checking other time points. So. This, uh, for this paper, we were only focusing on 24 hours after the reperfusion. Good, okay. And then the, the last question that she has is, um, she, she notes that you've, um, you've shown that EVs are taken up by the glial cells and that when you have that prion protein present, you're decreasing the infarct volume. Um, but do you know if there's any inflammatory, um, you know, changes to the microglia, or are you, um, you know, maybe skewing them more towards an anti-inflammatory phenotype, or is that something that you have looked at? Yeah, well, I mean, um, so here now, um, yeah, yeah, for sure, the, the, the microglia in the stroke is inflammatory, so at least at the, at the beginning of the, of the, the insult, um, but here we didn't look at uh, microglia, uh, so the microglia was from wild type and didn't suffer from anything, so didn't go through any um, um, glucose deprivation or oxygen glucose, dep glucose deprivation. But this is also a very good point. I mean, what happens when microglia is um, is uh, inflammatory microglia? Also, there's a, the same uptake or not of the EBS? Yes, this uh, we didn't check. Um, and then we have one more question from somebody whose microphone is not working. Um, and that is, why do you think that astrocyte EVs are increased during stroke? And, uh, and is there some mechanism that might lead to an increase in those uh, astrocyte-derived EVs? Yeah. So what is known is that, of course, astrocytes are also very fast um, uh, increasing in the, um, in the after stroke because, I mean, they have to go there and... Uh, and um, make the glial scar. So uh, many, many cells are mov mobilized uh, at the beginning of a stroke, microglia and astrocytes. And also there's a very, um, there's, there's a lot of uh, crosstalk between astrocytes and microglia. 
Um, so it has also been uh, observed in vitro that astrocytes uh, that they um, that they have prion protein in this case, so they are helpful or they are beneficial to neurons that are um, undergo um, glucose and oxygen deprivation as a model, uh, in vitro model of a stroke. So, and these astrocytes, um, they are protective um, for, the for the neurons only when they have prion protein. So, uh, I mean, this is something that, uh, I mean, there's uh, some in vitro studies that they show this. Um, also, astrocytes are increased um, after stroke, but also microglia is increased after stroke. So, exactly the, the, the relationship or, or why these uh, astrocytes are, are releasing these EVs and, and the cargo that they have, this is one of the questions that, uh, that we have and we would like to investigate further. Good. All right. So um, now I think uh, other people can probably unmute themselves. So let's start um, at the top here with uh, Iyal, my co-host. She has a question for you. Uh, hi, Berta. Thanks so hi. much. Okay. So uh, I just uh, wonder, like, do you have any explanation uh, why you see the dominant protein rich in your filtered EV as the ribosome proteins? Uh, are those proteins related to some function? Or uh, is there any possibility that those uh, ribosome proteins come from the intracellular contaminants? Yeah, so um, um, we think, because we are also uh, make some kind of investigations with RNA, we think that a small EVs are more but this is something that we, I don't want to say something that then I, I, I said, oh no, uh, this uh, <laughs> I should not have said. Uh, but so preliminary experiments show that probably these small EVs, um, they have uh, more um, RNA than, uh, and then uh, we think that maybe this, um, these small EVs are maybe uh, shuttling the whole the whole thing, so uh, RNA and um, and the ribosomes, the whole machinery. So, but this is very, very preliminary things that uh, are in our observation. Of course, uh, could also potentially be um, some some um, some unexpected uh, contaminations, but um, but it's quite consistent what we see. So. Um, and not only us, we see a lot of ribosomal proteins. If you check a little bit of the mass spectrometry that it's out there, you also see that there's uh, plenty of ribosomal proteins that are in EVs. Even uh, with uh, different protocols, so not only, yeah. so different isolation protocols. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting, good, okay. Um, so our next question is from Shivan. So this is um, about whether what you found in this mouse model, I mean, to what extent is it relevant to human? Um, and Shivam, please feel free to step in here too and, and elaborate if you'd like. Yes, sir. I, I wanted to ask that only that uh, the same mechanism is followed in humans also that, uh, that has been followed in mice, the pathways and all. Uh, sorry, to the, to the, the model that we are using? I think the question is whether this prion, these prion-related um, pathways, uh, if you expect that they are the same in human. Ah, um, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. So, in fact, it has been shown that in, um, in the penumbra of human samples, the prion protein is increased. So, when you, when you check by immunohistochemistry, it has been shown that, uh, that the prion protein is increased in the penumbra. So, it looks like it's a kind of um, a protective mechanism that wants to protect uh, the neurons in the penumbra. Yeah, not that many, not that much studies in humans are, are done in this regard, but it's uh, mostly immunohistochemistry, but it's quite consistent. I think so, so, so penumbra is, penumbra is in, is, is in uh, like uh, uh, resistant, I, I mean, it is resisting the, the, the protein, viral protein. Uh, you, no, no, this is the prion protein. It's a, it's a, the cellular prion protein. Okay, maybe, okay, 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 okay. Uh, okay sorry, okay. maybe I didn't get your question because the prion protein only in the prion diseases is when uh, it's, um, 
it's misfolded and it's resistant. Um, you, me, everybody has prion protein in the brain, that cellular prion protein, and it's, uh, it's, um, it's a normal prion protein, and it has some functions. Yeah, and okay, one okay. of those probably it's a protective, neuroprotective function. But I think that Herman Almepan, another, so wanted to say something. Yeah, just, just as, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. 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 Okay. So okay. I just wanted to add that, uh, of course, as always, you know, your, your voice is echoing. Your voice is actually echoing. It's, it's, it's a bit echoey. It's producing echo. Ah, okay, I try again. No, yeah, yeah, good. yeah. Yes. Okay, so the only thing that I want is a general comment, basically. Um, the question always is, how do you translate mouse results into human? No? The, good, the only thing and the good thing that I can tell you is that the mammalian prion protein is highly conserved. You know? And so far, basically everything what you found for the prion protein in mice was also valid in humans. But I'm not saying that these particular aspects that we are studying right now, uh, we can directly translate. Okay, 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 okay. I get it, I get it. Thank you, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, so uh, next question, Brian Bird. Um, you have a question about models and also uh, feasibility of getting CSS. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's nice work. I, I'm sure that the question I have sort of stems from my interest in whether or not this could be translated to people. Um, one of the things I'm wondering is, you know, the sampling of the CSF or the serum in the setting of, of, of the lack of integrity of the blood-brain barrier would be of interest um, for the clinical translation of this work, if that's feasible. But I don't know whether that can be studied in such a small, small animal, um, whether you can recover enough babies to study the question that way. So I thought I'd just open that question to you. Is that um, it technically is that feasible to kind of see us up open this room and try to see how your findings can be also observed in that fashion? Okay, I'm I'm I'm, I'm sorry, the voice was not that um, good. But um, so the question is if um, if these EVs that we see these different EVs, so more enriched the prion protein could be um, in the plasma, no, as a biomarker also. Uh, is this yes, yes, for, for, for plasma. A C C Z, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, this is uh, this is something that is interesting. I mean, it, um, as you said, no, the blood brain barrier is broken in stroke, and so many of the EVs can be then found probably in. CSF, and in fact, there's uh, some microRNAs that are already um, useful as, uh, or has been shown that they they can uh, give you a, an idea of um, of how of the outcome of the stroke. And this is uh, has been has been already been published. Um, the prion protein, uh, the increase of the prion protein in EVs. I don't know if it, is, it would be a specific for stroke or, or maybe in also in other diseases also fine. This I don't know, but uh, yeah, of course it's something that it uh, could potentially could potentially be detected. Yes. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, another question from Lucia is about whether you looked at no-go proteins, um, which she knows are also found in uh, neuroendocrine cancers. Thank you. Uh, no go. Uh, we didn't. We didn't check them. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Because oh, I found them in Exocarta. Uh, they are definitely there for brain uh, uh, vesicles. But uh, it, it's very interesting. There, there's a lot of them in the neuroendocrine cancer. So that, that's it, just a comment. Okay. Ah. Okay. Thank you. We didn't check. Yeah. Thank so you. maybe that's something that could that uh, that that you or somebody in your lab, Lucia, could look at in some of these data sets that um, that have been generated. Yes. Oh, definitely, definitely. I'll be in touch then, Bertha. Thank you, Ken. Yes, yep. very Great. good. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, next question, Erez. Hey, first of all, I really enjoyed the, the talk. I think it's an excellent uh, study uh, comparing the different type of exosomes and everything. I was curious. I'm thinking a lot about uh, neurodegenerative and the uh, secretion of misfolded proteins uh, what is it used for? And the fact that you saw the differentiation between lysosomes going more to the lysosome and going less to the lysosome with the PRP, uh, I was wondering if you're saying that it might be two subpopulation that is more relevant uh, uh, 
to the secretion of the misfolded proteins and if you have any insight on different cargo of the population that uh, have this PR PRP on the prion and the population without it? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. We don't have a um, uh, mass spectrometry of, of um, the, the, the population without the prion protein. Uh, but this is something that uh, it pop up also in some of our meetings. So it's something that it's uh, it's good. We we would like to to check uh, this. And um, so why the extracellular vesicles go to the lysosome? I think that it's something that uh, nobody really knows. It has been shown that this uh, that this happens, but nobody knows. I mean. Either they are degraded, maybe somehow, somehow. So it could also potentially be, and this is something that we could discuss, is that the, um, uh, the prion protein, in fact, has an, um, a role in, uh, in an immunomodulatory um, role. So it, uh, the prion protein is very rich in uh, immunoprivileged sites, so brain, uh, placenta, um, testes. So it could be that it's just, um, away from the from the immune sense to recognize um, what is uh, the, the prion protein it's recognized and, and, and protect let's say when the prion protein is not there maybe it's not uh, recognized as a as uh, a self let's say and then it's uh, eaten by the the microglia um, this uh, I don't know maybe plays a role in the Im immunomodulation and that's why um, they are um, more taken up when the prion protein is not there. But we don't, don't know the reason. May, may I add another comment? Because, because if, I, if I got Eris' question right, he was also uh, referring to neurodegenerative diseases and the misfolding of the prion protein, right? So this, of course, is something that we didn't touch here at all. We are just only talking about the physiological prion protein that is in all of our brains. In the moment that we are dealing with prions, so the misfolded infectious entities, then we would have to do um, experiments in, in completely different conditions in our security uh, lab. Um, and this is completely um, separated from what we are talking about here. But you are right, there were, there were of course studies that exosomes or EVs um, are potential carriers um, of misfolded prions uh, and that may play a role in the spreading of, of the pathology. But this is complete, I would really completely uh, um, separate this from the aspects discussed here. And I would highlight that I didn't mean to the misfolded prion, I would actually meant that we know that the prion, the PRP, the, the LC one is contributing to the amyloid beta misfolding and carrier into the exosomes. So that is carrying into the exosomes because it's a different subpopulation and, and play a role in the delivery of exosomes in diseases like Alzheimer or Parkinson's disease because I think that there is also paper on the alpha synuclein and not particularly in the, in the unique case of the misfolding of the prion one. Right, that, that's a good point. Uh, maybe I shortly uh, comment on this also. Uh, some years ago, we had a study published um, where we compared, but in vitro study, um, where we compared um, PRP containing uh, EVs with prion knockout EVs in the context of how much they bind a beta oligomers, so the Alzheimer um, uh, agent. And, um, and indeed, what we found, but it's a bit controversial, that um, PRP on EVs helps to rather bind and fibrilize a beta. And the current view is, or many people share this view at least, that fibrils of a beta are maybe not as toxic and harmful as uh, rather soluble oligomers. So we were rather pointing to a positive role of PRP on exosomes. Um, but other studies uh, observed uh, different effects, you know, uh, involvement in spreading and, and so on. Very interesting. Thanks for uh, thanks for that that discussion. Eris, did you have any follow up? No, I think it was a great comment. Thank you so much. Excellent. All right. Um, so our next question is about, um, and uh, this is from Sujasha. So if um, 
there's any role for potassium or um, or calcium gradients um, that that might be you know something that's contributing to this this uptake phenomenon that you observed. Do you, do you know of, of any evidence for this? And so, Josh, if you, feel free to step in here too to clarify if you if you feel like it. Yeah. Um, so, my main question arose from this fact that uh, Doctor, first of all, Doctor. But it was an excellent talk. I really liked it. And um, so my, I have some background. Uh, I have background in electrochemistry that is used in the, uh, like, involved in the circuitry of the human brain, or not human, the mice brain. But um, the fact that you mentioned that the astrocytes, EVs, uh, increase in the stroke, and astrocytes, the, the primary way of communication is by potassium signaling. So I was wondering if there might be a role of potassium or calcium signaling by which the prion proteins mediate the fusion of EVs with the, with the recipient cells. Oh, okay. Um, I, we didn't check anything about it, about uh, potassium or uh, calcium, but I think it's a, it's a very good point. It, it's a very good idea because uh, we don't know anything about it. And of course, uh, we don't know if uh, this is uh, directed or it's uh, just uh, um, the extracellular, so the um, astrocytes are um, taken up by everything or it's directed uh, to some particular recipient cell. And um, I mean, if they are more released because of this calc this potassium, this uh, could, yeah, this could be a, it's a, it's a good point. Thank you. Yes. All right, thank you, yeah. Maybe I will look into it later in my yes. research work. But yeah, thank you again. For thank you. Thank, thank you so much for the question. Um, so our, our next question, and I, I think uh, this is going to be difficult to to answer, but it's about size. You know, so we think about the size of EVs, and you know what what do we mean by small EV? What do we mean by large EV? So Krishna asks about whether you. You tried to look at that larger population. I know that you know, like like you, my lab usually does a filtration step um, before the final SEV isolation, and so that means that we we lose anything that's really large. Um, but I guess the, the the flip side to that is that um, I mean, the the question is which is more which is more abundant. Well, you know, the smaller ones generally EVs are going to fo follow a power law distribution. So the smaller the EV, usually the more there are until you get down to a particular size. Um, so the large ones aren't, aren't as abundant, but of course they have much more volume. So have you, um, have you done any, any uh, looking at uh, larger EVs and maybe in tissue sections or anything like that? No, not yet. We, we didn't do anything with the larger EVs, mm -hmm. no. Um, and it's, uh, I think that there was a paper also, there were two papers uh, published that they, they check and in fact it's the, as you said, no, that the small EVs are more abundant than the, than the larger EVs. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, we didn't do anything, no. Because also in the larger EVs, uh, yeah. I mean, of course we have to make a point that we make a differentiation, no? So we put these 200 nanometers and then we said, okay, small EVs, large EVs, but in, in fact, we don't really know uh, physiologically, no? Where is the, uh, where, where are the differences? Right. Yeah, so so I, I want to ask you too about the details of that two hundred oh. that two hundred uh, nanometer filtration, um, because we had we had questions about that during the review of our paper. Um, mm -hmm. You know, are we perhaps creating artifactual small EVs by you know pushing things through those those pores? What so so what what do you use gravity? Do you do you use gentle pressure? Do you you know how do you how do you actually force things through that filter? Yeah, so um, with the protocol of um, with the protocol that was published in two thousand twelve, this uh, Perez Rodriguez protocol, I think it was Perez Rodriguez. So um, the group um, of Efrat Levy, Perez no? Gonzalez, yes. Perez Gonzalez, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Perez Gonzalez. Um, so they did this uh, filtration step after the three hundred G uh, pellet, and this was really really difficult. I mean, we uh, push it, and it was a really difficult uh, task to do. So that's why we put it in this ten thousand G. Most of the people also does in after this ten thousand G, and it's much easy. So it's uh, I think it's much gentle. So. It's true that one can create some artificial, uh, maybe some membrane debris that are not um, down in these 10,000 Gs. So, but the, 
I don't know, personally, I mean, it could also be, but uh, that also then one does the, uh, the sucrose gradient or does a uricinol gradient, and that they are already this, this uh, artificially created um, EVs are exactly the same composition, lipidic composition that also floats in this density. I mean, yes, maybe we are um, having a lot of bad luck and, and then we have a, a lot of those, but of course it's difficult to differentiate. I don't know how much, um, how much uh, artificial EVs we are creating with this. Could potentially be some, but that on top of that, they are also in this um, in same density. I don't know. Also with the cytosolic protein present and uh, uh, mRNA no, intact. Uh, yeah, so at least what we get is something that it's circularized, also yeah. that has the has the has an EV shape. That if it's artificial or not, it's difficult to say. Mm. Yeah, but um, so Ken, sorry, you were saying that you also have this filtration step with a zero to micrometers, but yes. after which centrifugation do you Af after uh, after a ten thousand xg centrifugation? Okay, so like yeah. us. Basically. It's a very, it's pretty much the same that you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Okay, so I think we're coming toward to the end of our hour. Um, I know some people have to go, but I wanted to uh, just have one final question from Dara. Dara, do you want to ask about uh, about glycosylation? Sure. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, lovely story. So it's a broader question, but you know, spurred by kind of the observation that you had where. The, the glycan pattern for your EV seems like it's different from the whole cell lysate. I've seen this for a number of my own proteins, um, either from just endogenous cell lysates or even overexpressing. And I've seen it in the literature and I kind of just wanted to throw it back to everyone else. Um, are you also seeing this, is this a trend? Um, and if so, kind of, does anyone have any thoughts as to, you know, why this is, um, and kind of, um, you know, what the consequence might be. Um, so that the glycan pattern is different in EVs? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, here we don't know about the glycan pattern because, I mean, uh, the what we see is that the C1, it's deglycosylated also, so mm -hmm. has the two, two end glycans. Um, but I, I think that they are very much now going on some studies about um, glycosylation in EVs. No, I think that um, that I saw some papers about it, and that uh, it's really um, uh, they are, as you said. I think that uh, this. I don't want to uh, be mistaken, but I think that uh, there's some studies about uh, the glycans in EVs that they say that uh, they are different, and um, yeah. So, but I, I don't know um, about it. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, um, thanks everybody for the questions. I'm sorry to uh, to those who we, we did not get to. Um, feel free to reach out to um, to the presenters um, or to me. And um, anyway, I, um, I I just want to say thank you again to Berta and then also to Sandra and Hermann for joining us and sharing their expertise today. Um, and thanks everybody for joining. I hope you uh, all stay well and we look forward to seeing you again soon.